No English translation of the Bible has had more influence on the world than the King James Version. But have you read its preface? A lot of people haven't because for years it has usually been left out of printings of the KJV. Our guest in this episode wants to make sure more people listen to what these legendary translators had to say. So he's written a book called The Forgotten Preface, which aims to shed more light on this overlooked historical document. What did these men actually believe about inspiration, preservation, and translation? I'm Andrew Case, and this is Working for the Word. Yeah, my name is Josh Barzon, and I grew up really my whole life in different forms of, of King James onlyism. And I'll kind of give my story and kind of bring it to where I am today. And currently, I live in Iowa with my wife, Laura. Uh, we got two beautiful daughters. Tessa is four, and Emma is two. And uh, kind of at an interesting season of ministry and life right now, I work uh, vocationally with a financial group here in Des Moines, very active at my church here that we go to in our town. And previously, I'll kind of give you my younger years and then catching up to now, My I was born in Saudi Arabia. Uh, my dad was wow. military. Yeah, uh, born in, in Jeddah, right off the coast of the Red Sea in the early 90s. And my my parents, my mom and dad were, you know, just, you know, nominal average Catholics who were over there working for the State Department, uh, met, uh, got married, were expecting my oldest brother, and were just scared to death of raising their kid and what are we going to do? We know there's a God, but we don't know too much about him. So they actually went to a, a Bible study that they were invited to in Saudi Arabia and a uh, gospel uh, believing guy. A contractor had a Bible study, um, explained the gospel, and my parents got saved in Saudi Arabia by the Red Sea wow. back in the yeah turn of the 80s and the 90s. So my, my parents raised me and my two brothers to understand the gospel, um, understand a love for the Word of God, and I, I appreciate that and all the work my parents put into us. But from my earliest years on, the King James Version of the Bible was the only version that we used. Uh, and then it kind of grew a little later into not only is it the only version we use, but you know, all other translations are, you know, not, they're not versions, they're perversions and, you know, Satan's Bible and, you know, diluting and watering down the word of God. So that was, that was very heavily entrenched into my mind. Um, I kind of joke with people. I say I, I read way too many chick tracks as a kid. Uh, so that definitely didn't help my, <laughs> my view of bibliology. I feel for you, brother. I feel for yeah, you. Yeah. You, that's, you, that's traumatic. It, it really is. Especially when you get into like the, the, uh, animated graphic novels that he would do the, the comic book. And my gosh, I, I didn't want to walk out of my house how bad the world was painted in those things, you know. So, so yeah, grew up on that. And, uh, you know, I would say the, the kind of flavor of church we were in at that time was, you know, very independent, fundamental Baptist church, uh, especially as, you know, my teenage years uh, got into a church of that nature. And, uh, you know, a lot of good people, uh, definitely a love for the Word of God, which I really respect that group of churches for. Uh, but definitely took the position of King James and connected it to bibliology. So I, at 18, graduated high school, uh, went to college in Northwest Indiana, studied pastoral theology, uh, worked on staff at that church and college for a year, and then came out to Iowa to the church my wife had grown up at as, uh, you know, the assistant at the church, taught in the Christian school, uh, would preach, ran the youth ministry, uh, you know, did, did a lot of things there, very, very involved, full-time on staff there. Mm -hmm. And it came to a point, kind of through, I'd say, the, the death of a thousand cuts, that there were a lot of things in my life I was analyzing as now I have, you know, a daughter, we're expecting another child, and really mm -hmm. that weight of do I really believe certain things that I'm, I know I'm going to have to teach my children? And we won't go into all those areas because this is the one that was kind of the, the largest uh, in scale and volume that I had to deal with was, was the King James Bible. And yeah. I think it's interesting the two things God used to bring me away from a King James only position was working on my doctrinal statement for ordination 
and then working with non-English speaking refugees here in the Des Moines area. Mm. So it's interesting how God married those two together. I was working on my doctrinal statement after a couple of years of being on staff at the church to be ordained. As I did, I approached it very seriously of I, I can't just repeat and copy and paste my systematic theology outline from college, even though that would probably get a lot of thumbs ups and wouldn't be hard to do. And yeah. I really had to look at certain areas that I, I did kind of tweak. And uh, I would say, I wouldn't say change my position, but had a more defined biblical position on what I believed. And I always mm. tell people the funny thing is I, I came away going, wow, <laughs> I still believe the majority of everything I was taught. Like, you know, it, it's wonderful to realize, you know, how much there is of common truth that we can believe with one another, even though we may vary on things. And there were some things with ecclesiology, um, even with, you know, soteriology and then bibliology that were kind of my biggest uh, changes that I, I came to. And with bibliology, I came to it and realized, wow, most of these doctrinal statements from guys within my kind of network of churches, it's basically just a defense of the King James Version. There's there's really not much to the bibliology besides that. And I sure. really approached it taking the proof text, you know, Psalm 12 and, you know, and Matthew and, you know, Jesus with the Sermon on the Mount and realizing that those within context were not God speaking about an English translation 16 centuries later that he would furnish to the world. Could, could you uh, maybe briefly explain those proof texts to those who may not be familiar with them? Absolutely, how they, yeah. How they're, how they're used? For sure, yeah. So, so I'm going to read Psalm 12, 6 through 7, and I would say this is the paramount passage used to prove, or I would say to say this is why we hold a King James only position. And they'll say, you know, we use okay. the King James Bible alone. It's the sole word of God. And then you'll see on many doctrinal statements on especially church websites, Psalm 12, 6, and 7 is kind of the approval. And this is what it says in the King James. It says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. And, and that's important, the seven times. Thou mm -hmm. shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. There, in a sense, exegesis of that would be, yeah, in this translation, them and them, are referring to the words of the Lord. That will keep them, you know, God, God will keep his words. You'll preserve them, his words from this generation forever. If you get to some very extreme sides of KJVO, they take that purified seven times and they trace the different translations through history to say the King James is the seventh translation. Therefore, it's the pure oh. translation of God's word. Oh, okay. Yeah, very allegorically interpreted there. Real quick, without, you know, you can find people that do a much better explanation of this, but uh, the biggest problem with this is in context, um, the psalmist David is is talking about God preserving the righteous and the oppressed, and that God will keep them, the, the, the righteous, through all generations. And what's really interesting is even in the 1611 King James Version, which has footnotes and marginal notes, even the translators put in the margin that them is referring to the righteous and not to the words of God. So, wow. Yes, it's it's almost like God put a dead man switch in the King James with that fundamental passage. So that that's what I'm talking about when I say those are that I'd say that's the hallmark and the paramount view of bibliology connecting to the King James within fundamentalism such as that. You you also mentioned Matthew 10? Yeah, let me flip there too. Where Jesus basically says, you know, a jot or tittle will not pass, you know, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will not pass away. That passage there talking about, therefore the King James is that, that Jesus was talking about. So here's the mm. thing, Andrew, is it, it got hard because I realized for me to accept those things talking about the King James, if they even are talking about the King James and, and Bible translations, it puts me in this issue of where was God's pure word up until 1611? That was my hardest struggle coming into this that really made me go, okay, Josh, you can't ignore this. You got to think. So I began with my doctrinal statement to do a lot of study into this and to look at really with an unbiased lens, the history of English translation through John Wycliffe and then through William Tyndale and up through the Geneva translators and then, you know, to 1611 and realizing, wow, this is not as black and white as it was presented to me previously and realizing that, wow, there, there have always been differences between different translations through the ages. 
And yet God's word is present and powerful and accepted, you know, by the church. So that that's my doctrinal statement side coming to these things and, and coming to a balanced view. But I think what really broke me then was working with some Arabic speaking refugees in the Des Moines area. And with my background growing up in the Middle East, I, I speak enough Arabic to be dangerous. So I <laughs> mm-hmm. I can greet someone, say hello, and then, you know, after a couple phrases, say, hey, that's about all I got. And I was doing some Bible studies with them, really trying to show them from the Gospels, which they take as holy writings, Isa, you know, Jesus, you know, is not just a prophet, but is, you know, the Christ, the Messiah. And... I found myself with one Iraqi man that I was doing a Bible study with, reading it to him out of the King James, these passages, and he is just looking at me, blinking his eyes like, okay, he's like, I kind of know what you're saying, but this just sounds interesting. And and the funny thing is, he actually spoke decent English. And I was Mm. like, wow, He, he owns his own business. Me and him can talk about the weather and sports in America and Iraq. But when I start reading the King James, I can tell he's like, there's enough dust in a sense on what I'm reading that it's putting a block between what I'm trying to say to him. So that really got me to go, man, I need to reevaluate. This is serious. So this is going to cause me, you know, to have trouble with evangelism. And I found myself on the fly translating and then wondering, oh, should I have translated it that way? And going back to Hebrew and Greek and realizing, oh man, wow, I, I thought I knew what that meant. That, that word doesn't mean this or that. And Mm -hmm. This is what's going on. And then I would say the feather on the camel's back that broke me is what we're going to talk about predominantly today is I read the preface to the translation of the King James Version Bible that I could not believe I had never read in my life before. And I read this very old, antiquated 50-page document that used to be in the front of King James Bibles and ended up coming up with 10 theses of what they believed about translation, inspiration, and preservation of God's word actually ended up presenting that to my to leadership to my pastor at the church that I worked for and mm. long story short was uh was asked to leave the church over my position of not mm. holding the King James to be the only translation of God's word that I believe is God's word so that succinctly as I could put it how I got to where I am now and I give the credit to yeah. God, but he used especially uh, the King James preface to help break me from that position. So that, that would be the majority of kind of my background of coming out. Yeah. Now, normally the preface is not included in printings of the KJV today. Is that correct? That is correct. Do you know why that is? And how did you end up wanting to read that preface and finding it? Yeah, great, great question. So I'll answer uh, the first question. Why is it not included in most King James translations today? I wondered if there was like a nefarious reason behind it. The more I looked, there was not. I think actually the more I, I looked into it at the turn of the 20th century, especially as mass production of books in growing population and print demands, I think it was an easy part to not have to print to save printing costs. That's my educated opinion. And I would say the footnote I've put in there as to why I think that is David Norton has a great book on the history of the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. And I would say he's one of the foremost scholars just about the history of the King James Bible, the committees. And he notes that too, that it seems around that time, it was a a printing cost issue, not, not some nefarious reason behind it. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, that's really good to know. Yeah, and then Mm -hmm. as to why I wanted to read it, so it's really funny the things that God puts as time bombs in your mind that explode at a later point of like, oh, I forgot about this. And during a college chapel, I actually remember a guest preacher talking about there being a letter from the translators in the front of your Bible. I don't think he was saying it in a way to negate King James onlyism. I think he was, I, I've said before, I think he was just being kind of hokey of like, you know, you should read your Bible, you know, cover to cover, you know, even the maps and even, you know, the concordance and even, you know, if you got that letter at the front, read that too. So he, there was no subliminal message of what he was saying. And I, I remember opening up my Bible and going, man, I got gypped. They didn't put it in my Bible, you know? And then Later on, I, I actually inherited a, a New Cambridge Paragraph Bible, which it is a King James Bible, but it's in paragraph format. And lo and behold, it, it had the preface in the beginning of it. And at that time, you know, I'm holding the King James Bible and I'm like, wow, I, this is that letter that guy was talking about. 
but I still didn't really do much more than peruse it. And then when I was doing all of my study several years later um, for my doctrinal statement, wondering about these questions, I um, remembered I had that in the Bible. It was very small print, so I ordered a, a mass media production on Amazon that I actually bought and started highlighting it and underlining it because I, I had been reading both sides of this issue. I, you know, on the King James side, I was reading, you know, David Sorensen and, and David Cloud and even some of the, you know, kind of more eclectic people like Sam Gipp and, you know, Gail Ripplinger. And then on the other side, I'm, I'm reading those opposing it, such as, you know, James White, you know, Mark Ward and D.A. Carson. And, and I was just so mm -hmm. in a straight of what to do. They were both making these arguments that I could see going both ways. And then I remembered, wait a second, that preface, let me see what, let me see what they had to say. And that's what sparked my interest in, in reading and, and kind of detailing their work. Okay. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. So I guess that brings us to the meat of the interview today. And let's walk through, you have a book called The Forgotten Preface. So let's walk through the different points from the KJV preface that you're talking about one by one and, and see what we can learn. Okay. Sounds good. So, so yeah, what I'll, I'll go over here, uh, you know, like Andrew said, it, the, the forgotten preface ended up being my, my work that I did wasn't well received at the church I was at. So I took it and put it into book format and, uh, was able to publish it and it's on Amazon and uh, we'll talk more about just some good responses later. But what I do in chapter one is I give 10 theses just using the quotes of the translators to show you what they believed. So this is not subjective. It's very objective. So yeah, I'll I'll go through the majority of them. I'll, I'll spend more time on the certain ones I've highlighted, but I'll, I'll start with thesis number one, which is that the King James translators believe that any attempt to, pr to produce a modern translation of the Bible would be met with resistance and suspicion. And hmm. it's important to understand that the King James translators produced a modern translation of the Bible in 1611, just as modern translations today are attacked for being modern in their contemporary time. I'll read a quote from the translators here about this. And they said, modern Bible translations are welcomed with suspicion instead of love and with emulation instead of thanks. And if there can be any hole left for a petty objection to enter, and a petty objection, if it does not find a hole, will make one. It is sure to be misconstrued and in danger to be condemned. This will easily be granted by as many as know story or have any experience. For was there anything ever projected that savored any way of newness or renewing, but the same endured a many storm of gainsaying and opposition? So layman's terms, if you do something new, you're going to get criticized for it. Yeah, and nothing has changed. <laughs> Not at all. And I mean, Andrew, couldn't you see that being in the beginning of modern translations today as to why we're putting this translation on the market? I mean, very applicable, isn't it? They say this as well. They say, whosoever attempteth anything for the public, especially if it pertains to religion and the opening and clearing of God's word, the same sets himself upon a stage to be gloated upon by every evil eye. Yea, he casts himself headlong upon pikes to be gored by every sharp tongue. For he that meddleth with men's religion in any part, meddleth with their custom, nay, with their freehold. So let that sink in that they realized to do what we know is right will have us end up messing with tradition, religious tradition, which always ends up getting you into trouble. So that that would be thesis one. Um, and I just like to quote their words and I have a little bit more expounding that in my book, but they, they knew as we do this, this, there will be opposition to our work. And then thesis number two is that the King James translators believe that the Bible should be available in the plainest and commonest English of the present age. This really helped me to get a proper view of bibliology in this area when I read this part of their preface. And you have to understand, they're going to use the word vulgar and, you know, they're not talking about, you know, vid angel censors out, you know, on, on your TV. Vulgar in that sense is vernacular, common, you know, known. They were very, I would say, diligent to make sure that people knew we are making this translation because we want, you know, the essence of William Tyndale for the plowboy even to understand the word of mm -hmm. God. So I have here a quote of theirs, which is very, very fitting. They said this, they said, 
we desire that the scripture may speak like itself, as in the language of Canaan, that it may be understood even by the very vulgar. So when I read that, I just stopped and thought, wow, that's an interesting point these guys are bringing up. They're saying the way that the children of Israel at Mount Sinai heard the law read to them, and it was not strange or different words. It was the way they spoke to each other throughout the camp. That is yeah. how the word of God needs to be read and understood by those that hear its opening and reading today. That that was very significant to me when I read that part of, of the preface. Yeah. What every translator should have as a goal, just for those who may not be familiar, how many people were involved in the translation of the KJV? It's interesting. There, there's some debate, and I've gotten some pushback off of what I've said before. I, I would say a good round number is between 50 to 60 translators. And there's different, you know, well, maybe it was this and that, but it looks like about 50 to 60 guys total. Yeah. And I, I would say that's such an admirable goal, especially for men who were the top scholars of their time, amazing men of learning. Uh, if you read some of the biographies of these guys, it's just, it blows you away, some of the, the geniuses of their day. But to for them to want to communicate to the simple people of the world is, is really admirable. Absolutely. And I joke with people, and you might get this kind of nerdy, tongue-in-cheek joke, but I say, you know, even Lancelot Andrews, you know, on the translation committee, you know, even though he was born from the womb speaking Greek and Hebrew, he still wanted people to know how to understand God's word in common English, <laughs> you know, because yeah. it, it seems the, the age that he learned these languages keeps getting younger and younger the more you hear people <laughs> tell the stories. So, so, so yeah, that was, you know, that, that was a desire of theirs. They go on through this. This is a good pivot point to thesis number three, which is that the King James translators believed that God historically used and blessed faulty translations in the past. This is interesting. This, this is very significant. When you realize, okay, starting point, 1611, God's word existed before that. And the King James translators were honest about the limitations of Bible translation. And the best example they use that I'll, I'll give you some of their quotes is they reference the Septuagint as being God's word and yet not being perfect. It's such an interesting comparison they make to this point that they're bringing up. They say here in the preface under my thesis three, they say it is certain that the translation of the Septuagint was not so sound and so perfect, but that it needed in many places correction. And who had been so sufficient for this work as the apostles or apostolic men? So let me stop here. They're saying everyone acknowledges that the Septuagint had many places of correction that it needed. And, you know, you and I know there, there's not just one monolithic Septuagint, but, you know, the Septuagint readings and writings, depending on which one you're looking at. They bring up an interesting point that who would have been better to correct the Septuagint than the apostles and the early church fathers? And then the translators say this. They said, yet it seemed good for the Holy Ghost and to them to take that which they found rather than by making new in a new world in the green age of the church to expose themselves to many exceptions and trivial objections as though they had made a translation to serve their own endeavors thus bearing themselves witness and not to be regarded. Uh, just the way these yeah. guys are thinking through just even the ethos that the apostles would have had to deal with if they said, hey, guys, you know, God has inspired us to write these writings. Let's correct this. And, you know, there can be some debate here. But I, I do hold that, you know, many of the quotations and citations in the New Testament seem to match very closely to Septuagint readings over Masoretic text readings. So that seems to me to be what, you know, the KJV translators are, are acknowledging here. It's a very powerful argument. And I'll, I'll just insert here, once again, it's so important for translators not to have chronological snobbery and read these old guys from the past and what they were dealing with in translation. Because, you know, surprisingly, when I took translation principles and and other courses at Canael and other other places, I was never required to read this kind of stuff in the past. And it really is a master class on translation and translation principles and translation politics that uh, more people need to read in their formation to go into Bible translation. I highly commend it. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I, I agree. Yeah. So this this is a good segue into the next 
point, the thesis, but I'll read, it still is under thesis three about the translators talking about the Septuagint. They said, the translation of the 70, you know, referring to the Septuagint, dissenteth from the original Hebrew scriptures in many places, neither doth it come near to it. And he says, but they used it and they would not have done, nor by their example of using it so grace and commend it to the church, if it had been unworthy of the acclamation of the name of the word of God. So very highly they're standing on the fact that previous translations have had errors and they still are the word of God. And then thesis four is that the King James translators believe that differing translations and even faulty translations are still the word of God translated. So this statement here by the translators is very profound. I'd say one of the uh, most important statements they make in their entire preface. And they say this, it's a short one. They say, now to the latter, we answer, we do not deny, nay, we affirm and avow that the very meanest or crudest or vulgar or not the best translation of the Bible in English set forth by men of our profession contains the word of God, nay, is the word of God. So they're affirming here, listen, even a translation that we might say, hey, we have some differences here. Not not that there is a heretical undercurrent to make something wrong on purpose, but we're going to take translation for what it's worth and not condemn it and say that was not God's word, even though there may be some errors and, you know, some issues that we have with it. That would be, you know, thesis four. And then this is what I would say is the, the hallmark thesis that when I wrote this down, when I was going through and writing my theses of what I got from the, the preface, I remember reading the original preface and laughing out loud when I realized that the translators believed, as I say in thesis number five, that their own translation was not perfect. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Oops. come on, guys. You, like, I'm, you know, when I, when I read the King James translators say, hey, guys, like, you know, very, you know, vernacular form here. This is going to be, you know, the message translation of this. They're going to go, guys, we made mistakes, too. Just keep that in mind. And I'm like, oh, I, I don't know if I need to read anymore. I mean, they're just being very honest. And I'll give you their actual quote. They say this. They say, no cause, therefore, why the word translated, speaking about their translation, the KJV, should be denied to be the word of God or forbidden to be current, notwithstanding that some imperfections and blemishes will be found in the setting forth of it. And they acknowledge that. They, they go into detail, you know, read the actual preface if you can, and, and they give examples of there are certain stones and animals and things of very obscure nature that are not even once found in Hebrew literature. And basically, we had to guess <laughs> what was the best translation for this kind of bird, this yep. kind of stone. And, and you know, take that with a grain of salt, you know, they're telling us as, as we continue to do translation work today. I think it shows a lot of humility in the translators to be that honest about what they were setting forth. Absolutely. And I, I'll comment here that this is the reason that we have to train the indigenous to to the highest level possible for as Bible translators, because no matter how good the consultant is that works through the first version of their their Bible and their mother tongue, there are going to be mistakes that they make and that the consultant makes and misses or bad advice that he gives. And they need to be empowered to be able to keep revising, keep improving that Bible for the rest of their lives without that consultant or any consultant. So anyway, that's oh, just a little I love comment it. And there. I, I know you have obviously a lot of experience with foreign language translations, and this is a little bit of a soapbox of mine. I always thought it was funny while I was in King James only churches that missionaries would come through and say, hey, we need you guys to support us. We need to translate the Bible, you know, into this, you know, tribal language of, you know, Kenya that we're going to. And I told my wife after the fact, when we had left, you know, that kind of movement, I said, isn't it funny that they didn't say, hey, guys, we need to find out what, how they spoke, you know, this Kenyan language 400 years ago. And we're going to translate it into that. We took for granted these guys were supporting <laughs> with our money. We're going to find the most common tribal language and translate it into that. And we have to realize that we have to apply those same principles to English as well, if, if that makes sense. If you have a chance to read my book or the preface, uh, really spend some time on that thesis five. I give a lot of quotes of them giving examples of imperfections and, you know, things of that nature. But I'll, I'll go to thesis six. This is an interesting one. They And I won't spend too much time on this, but they put here that the King James translators did not believe that only the most educated scholars 
were exclusively capable of translating the scriptures. One short quote they say here, they, they say, our critics say, if it must be translated into English, speaking of the Bible, the Catholics are fittest to do it. They have learning and they know when a thing is well. And then they say, but we building upon their foundation of previous translations that went before us and being holpen by their labors do endeavor to make that better, which they left so good. No man, we are sure, hath cause to mislike us. The previous translators, we persuade ourselves, if they were alive today, would thank us. It's interesting, just their homage to the past of, listen, guys, if we're going to be honest, yes, the the Catholic scholars, you know, an understanding of this time, they're not just talking about the religious institution of the Catholic Church, but the the global dominance the Catholic Church had in politics and education and, and, and all of those means. Sure, they have the means to do this, but we persuade ourselves that we are just building upon the foundation of you know, the Vulgate and, you know, the Bishop's Bible and, and so forth and so on. So they were very humble as well, you know, admitting that it does not take the most educated person, although we definitely want an, a translator to be educated. They're, they're striking a good balance there for, for future translators. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very humble statement for sure. Uh, thesis seven, I'll, I'll just read this one. And I think this is, you know, there's more to read if you want on your own, but um, thesis seven is that the King James translators believe that those opposed to modern translations would use the age of previous translations to argue against new translations. I think the Latin Vulgate is one of the greatest examples. You know, it's, it's funny. I've one of the biggest yeah. arguments I've heard when I say I don't use the King James on, only exclusively anymore. And people say, well, God's used it for the last 400 years. Are you saying God got it wrong? And, you know, I think, well, if I was around a couple hundred years ago, I'd say, well, you know, the Vulgate's been around for a thousand years. Why do we need to change anything? And I realize you just have to go back in history a little bit further <laughs> and, and your argument falls apart to just use whatever previous variable you want to plug in for your argument. Yeah. And back then, you know, you go back 200 years, everyone would say, well, Latin isn't that hard to learn. I mean, everyone Absolutely. knows Latin, right? Just just buck up and, and learn Latin. It's so funny, but, you know, I, I read about in the early colonies, these, you know, primers that these, you know, third graders are reading and they're learning Latin and, you know, higher stuff than I learned in middle school and third grade. So, yeah, it's it's all relative as to what you could say you know, stop trying to be lazy. And, you know, at, at that point, then I think we should all just learn Greek and Hebrew, which... To be honest, I'd actually be more in favor of that if we really would <laughs> educate people to do so. <laughs> right. But yeah, so so that's that. They, they, they gave that statement. And then uh, winding towards the end, they say here in thesis number eight, I have here that the King James translators believe that manuscripts and translations should not be judged by the men that compiled them, even if those men held erroneous beliefs and heretical doctrines. This definitely gets in kind of a ethical kind of situational ethics here of at what point do you reject someone doing something of Christian nature if they're not a believer or not orthodox? Well, you know this, Andrew, I'm sure. Some of the, the biggest claims brought against modern translations, especially those that use, you know, you know any Nestle, yeah, any Nestle law or critical text, yeah. you know, manuscripts, yeah, NIV, NASB, ESV, is they're all based on Westcott and Horton. Those guys... You know, they, yeah, they had tattoos of 666 on their biceps and <laughs> whatever you want to put in there. You have, <laughs> I've heard the most outlandish things about them. And, and I want to say this. Let's take for granted that Westcott and Hort were absolute closet demon worshipers. The point is they themselves did not, even if I give you that, they themselves did not make the Greek manuscripts which they were working with. Along with that, the King James translators point out that they were standing on the shoulders of men that likely would not share eternity with them for the work that they were using right now. They mention Aquila and Symmachus and Theodotion. They say here, I, I got to find it. They quote Augustine and they say also Augustine was of another mind. Or um, Let me back up. So the translators say this. They say, <clears throat> our critics urge for their second defense of vilifying and abusing our translation, which they meet us with is that heretics were the authors of translations. We marvel what divinity taught them so. And, and then they quote Augustine, who said that he used certain rules of Ticonius, uh, who was a Donatist, for the better understanding of the word. He says that, to be short, Origen and the whole Church of God for hundreds of years used principles by Aquila and by Symmachus, who, and Theodotion, who was an Ebionite, which were most vile heretics that joined themselves together 
with the Hebrew original of the translation of the 70. I'm skipping here because this is such a chunky section here, but they're acknowledging, guys, listen, there were some unbelievers in the past that were very gifted with the knowledge of Hebrew and, and of, you know, Greek and these things. If what they say is true, truth belongs to God, and we're going to attribute that work to being truth, not to the, the character of the man that put it together. Um, I hope that makes sense. I, I feel like there's a lot to unpack here, but you know, for those listening that don't know a lot about church history, you know, do a little crash course on the Donatists and the Ebionites. They believe some very wacky things about the deity of Christ and what happened to him, you know, at his, you know, baptism. And it seems like an ancient form of modalism, you know, that we call unorthodox today. And yet these are some of the people involved in manuscripts and translation work that even the King James translators give credence to, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Read some more there. I'm struggling kind of to put that all together, but I, I'm better on paper than word of mouth. <laughs> and then thesis number nine, second to last one here. And this is the one I'll, I'll spend kind of the last bit of time with. They, and I'll wrap it up with number 10. Thesis nine says uh, the King James translators did not believe in an absolute word for word translation and even situationally use dynamic equivalents. I think it's funny. That was one of the greatest vices that I heard about all modern translations. They they all use this evil thing called dynamic translation where, you know, instead of saying, you know, though your sins are as red, I'll make them white. Someone could say they'll be the inside of a coconut. You know, I, I've heard these these weird claims of, you know, if we if we open up the doors, then we can replace white with the inside uh -huh. of a coconut for a missionary that wants to translate. And, and it's almost like dynamic equivalence within the realm of King James only is a bad thing rather than understanding it's a tool that you use. I think it's important to realize mm -hmm. that modern translations today fall on a spectrum of formal, you know, too dynamic. So, you know, the ESV or, you know, New King James Version or the NASB would be more formal. And then a NLT, you know, a uh, even CSB to some degree, NIV would be more dynamic. And the, the King James translators, contrary to popular opinion, did use situational dynamic equivalence when they could not bring something over as clearly as they wanted it to in their translation. And that is probably very shocking to a lot of people. <laughs> it, it is. I'll read one quote of theirs. They say this, and I think this just sums up what they're saying about they received a lot of opposition because they chose to not always translate one Hebrew word always into the same English word. And they chose not to always translate one Greek word always into one English word. They, they said this, I love this quote of theirs. They say, for is the kingdom of God words and syllables? Why should we be in bondage to words and syllables if we may be free? So they understood with the work they were doing, they had to take some liberties to translate in a way that would communicate the message, even while keeping a very formal method of translation. So that, that would be thesis number nine. And then thesis 10, wrapping it up, is that the King James translators believe that God was blessing their endeavor, regardless of what the established church and religious crowd thought. They, they close their preface saying this. They say many other things might give thee warning, gentle reader, if we had not exceeded the measure of the preface already. But it remains that we commend thee to God and to the spirit of his grace, which is able to build further than we can ask or think. He removeth the scales from our eyes, the veils from our hearts, the opening of our wits, that we may understand his word, enlarging our hearts, yea, correcting our affections, that we may love it above gold and silver, yea, that we may love it to the end. And that, that's how they close off their, their preface. Yeah, fantastic. And, and also to mention, in your book, then you include the whole preface at that length. That is correct. And, and one thing I want to mention, it is a, a more modern translation of it. So it's been put into modern English, and there's been even me and a couple other editors that helped me with it um, actually kind of modernized it. So it, I've heard from people that have read the book that it's a pretty smooth read compared sure. to the original preface. Yeah, thank you for doing that work. That's uh, really a blessing to the church to have have access to that more uh, in a smoother form. So now the question is, where does somebody go if they're convinced by your thesis, right? And so in your book, you give the, the NKJV as an alternative. Tell us a little bit about why you chose to commend that version and 
some of the background and purpose of the NKJV that people may not know about, because there were definitely things in there that I had never heard. Yeah, I'd be glad to. And I'll try to be as brief as I can because I'm really making pennies off of this on Amazon. I want this to be a resource to people. When you go on Amazon and see the price, it is very affordable. I think it's like 6 or $7 and it basically covers the printing costs. Read through this if you're interested in this. I think it could be a help to you, especially if you are in the midst of a King James only uh, position. But, you know, Andrew, the the New King James Version was the first modern translation that I used coming out of a King James only position. Coming to it, what helped me is that I back up, you know, during my doctrinal statement and this and that, I, I would theoretically say, you know, if they would make a modern translation that was based on the correct manuscript tradition, of course I'd use it, but unfortunately that's, that's never been done. You see, I was taught in Bible college and even after that, every modern translation uses the corrupt critical text is how they would put it. Only the King James is faithful to the textus receptus. So you have to keep in mind if you're listening that there are two main streams of manuscripts that Bible seem to come from. Those coming from the Textus Receptus, we could even put maybe majority text. Those are not the same. There are a lot of differences between them, but that would be one category. And uh, then you have critical text leaning Bibles, which is the majority of modern translations. So when I found out from doing research that the New King James translation is based on the TR tradition of the King James, I was blown away because I was told my whole life that it wasn't. It was based on the critical text. And as I studied it, that was my first comparison. I got a parallel King James, New King James Bible and read them side by side and was just blown away how much clarity it was giving me. And I've had people that have no King James background tell me they struggle with the New King James because it still is very in the tradition of the King James, very formal, very, very regal sounding. But for me, coming from King James only, sure. I mean, I felt like I was reading a brand new Bible. It was just that fresh and amazing to me. Yeah, the, the New King James was initiated in 1975 under Dr. Arthur Farstead, and he wanted to create a modern translation that was based on the same tradition of the manuscripts of the King James translation. And many people might not know this, and I, I say this boldly because I have the backing and the, the proof of it. The New King James actually corrects and is more faithful to the TR than even the King James in certain places, where even the King James seemed to default to the Vulgate or to a different reading uh, of of the manuscripts. Yeah, I have a wow. I have a whole comparison where it'll it seems like it defaults to Erasmus, you know, a Tyndale reading, you know, or even a Vulgate reading. So. Uh, Arthur Farstead includes that in his book, The New King James and the Great Tradition. The, the reason I offer that is my next chapter, my book is a recommendation and an endorsement is it's the next natural step. If somebody is like, I'm in King James only, I'm still kind of leery about modern translations. I still have some curiosity and, and kind of concerns about, you know, textual variants, you know, when it comes to manuscript traditions. I think this is a healthy mo translation that you're not going to have to worry about those questions in your mind of, you know, did they quote unquote, take this verse out? Or, you know, is this passage going to be in there? It's the same textual basis. And then from there, you know, I was able to do more education and research to understand textual criticism and a balanced understanding to understand Bibles that don't use the TR and understanding why the decisions were made for that. So this I say would be a, a really good bridge which I know that's going to trigger some people. Oh, it's the bridge. You're trying to get us away from the truth. No, it's it's a bridge to a healthy understanding of bibliology. And I think the New King James is a wonderful way to connect yourself to that. Yeah. It, so I guess it has been slandered over the years by KJV onlyism, as as far as claiming that it wasn't based on the TR. That is that is correct. They would say that it you know, they lied and and it's based on the the critical text is what they would say. Yeah, I still remember going to London to visiting Spurgeon's old church and finding in their bookstore these little booklets against the NKJV because it is a KJV O church which blew me away. Um I think I mentioned this already in in a past episode but I still can't get over <laughs> that KJV O people would be so against the NKJV that they would even write a whole p 
pamphlet about it and and want to take the time instead of just spending that time and energy making an updated version of their own KJV if they really want to make sure it's up to their standards you know <laughs> the hard thing though is they would all fight with each other over any choice they made so they know they can't do it or else they'd all attack whatever decision they made <laughs> yeah yeah and it's interesting i wonder if some of those pamphlets yeah I, i've probably seen them before but you know funny side note here and this is in my book in chapter four on historic christians that use modern translations um charles spurgeon himself used the rv of 1881 and even referred to textual variants as being more accurate than the King James. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I did not know that. Yep. Chapter four of my book, a bunch of quotations about that. So yeah, they seem to have drifted after that. Yeah. The biggest thing I can say here is I have 10 attacks defended that are given against the New King James Version. Things like people will say the New King James distorts the doctrine of hell. Um, It distorts the doctrine of salvation. It removes plural and singular forms of words. What they're doing is circular reasoning of starting with the point of the King James to use that to defend every choice made in the King James. So I I would say spend some time on that. And I think even if you have no connection and you don't even want to use the New King James, that's fine. I think you'll just have an appreciation for this tradition and understanding you know, a tool that is out there to help people that are in the midst of this. I, I understand that I have a very niche audience I'm reaching and I'm, I'm happy as small as it is, um, to help bring people, you know, from where they are to a healthy position with my book. Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's get into some responses. If you have any to share, I'd love to hear, have there been any testimonials or, uh, even negative feedback, um, about your book so far? (laughs) For sure, yeah. Um, I'll give you a negative first, and then I'll, I'll go to positive. Funny enough, I'm, I'm very happy that I have not received a lot of negative response. And I've published it and advertised it very widely, even among those that I know still hold a you know, King James-only position. I So I'll start with negative move up. One guy, you know the people on Facebook that you put a paragraph post up and they basically write you, you know, a dissertation back as the response. And it's like, oh, I don't have time to, you know, and then you, you come back and then they give you a second dissertation. I've had one guy like that and, and he is using the thing of saying, well, you can't say the translator said because the preface was just a PR stunt that they had to put in the front of it to get it accepted. It doesn't hold up. Even Mark Ward, if you know him, he does a whole video actually responding to this person and showing how that is not true. And not only that, but the problem is, let's say he is correct. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Everything the King James translators are saying about the need for vernacularness, the need for dynamic translation at points, the need for understanding differences in translations, you actually see that qualified as you read the King James and see what they were saying in the preface is actually happening in your your King James Bible. So that's the most, and, and he is very ardent. He would say there never could be another translation that could ever be used. He's not even like this middle ground guy. He's still a very ardent King James only yeah. guy. Besides that, I've gotten some pushback of just people from my past that are, you know, Josh, why are you leaving the gospel? And, you know, sure. you're, you're going to go down a dangerous path. And I guess in a funny way, I, I know they love me and they care about me. So I don't look at them with any scorn. I just think they're kind of misguided with how they look at that. I just try to respond kindly and say, hey, listen, I know we differ, but still love you. You're a brother in Christ. And I appreciate you giving me those concerns. But I promise I still believe the gospel. And, you know, we're still in this together. We're in the body of Christ. Now transitioning to positive, I've actually had a good chunk of people that still hold a King James only position that have read my book and said, Josh, I, I still hold a King James only position, but you've given me some really good points to think about. And I appreciate that you were respectful and kind and how you treat us in the book. And you don't, you don't put people like us down. So I would say Mm -hmm. that was the biggest compliment I received from my book is that even those that don't agree with me would at least acknowledge that I have been kind and been very equitable in how I have dealt with the position, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. And I do appreciate that about your book, that you're not out there to demonize KJV only and all of that, which unfortunately we can't say usually of KJV only's treatment of of <laughs> modern translations. It, it does tend to veer off into calling things and people satanic. And Yeah. And then one last thing I'll say is I've actually had a good handful, I'd say at least a dozen, if not more. 
and this is, again, you know, I published this back in May. So, you know, we're going on, you know, the better part of the year now. Yeah, not even a year yet of it being out. And I received a dozen or more responses of Bible college students, pastors, and even missionaries that are in King James only churches telling me like, wow, I needed this. Like, I felt like you wrote this for me. This actually helped me come out of King James only. I even have a couple people now that I still periodically message and chat with on Facebook or Twitter that still working these things through and they ask me questions and I help them. And I've had one missionary that told me, Josh, I and where you're at, I understand this, but I can't be public about this or I'd lose my ministry. I'd lose all my support. So there's yeah. a pretty wide range of people that have reached out and it makes my heart hurt for those that are stuck in it. But it also makes me very encouraged that I see this as actively shedding light on this very important topic. Absolutely. Well, that's really good news. Praise God that he's using it that way so far in people's lives. Because that's just a beginning of a beautiful journey for those people to rediscover the Bible and to really engage with it in a deeper way. Well, great. Is there anything else that I haven't asked or prompted that you'd like to mention or comment? No, I just want to thank you for having me on. I'm, the best thing I can say at the end here is if you're someone listening that is in King James onlyism, please know that I still view you as my brother in Christ and I have nothing against you. But I would ask you to honestly look at the points that I bring up and use a fair assessment um, as you look at these issues without an unfair scale of maybe what you already have in your mind. And for those that aren't in King James only and you're thinking, what in the world? Why, why would anyone believe this? Understand that these people in King James Onlyism actually very highly regard God's word and uh, really are, are wanting to protect it. So there's a virtue that they have there. You're able to, you know, read the book, share it with somebody. I've had people message me and say, hey, I, I bought three copies. I'm giving them to, you know, all three siblings that are in this. God has allowed this book, thankfully, to, you know, it's on Amazon. You can get it paperback form. You can get it in Kindle ebook. And then I just recently had a professional audible narrator do my book as a audible version so you can listen to it as well. Yes, it's in all three formats and very affordable. I want this to be a tool for the church, like you said, Andrew, and that's my prayer and, and my desire is that if you hear this, let this be a tool um, that you can use to continue to help others. And I would also add that we, we really do owe the KJV translators the respect of reading the preface that they took time to write. Because the, they wrote things that they thought were important for people to understand. People who, who love the KJV, they ought to respect and admire those authors enough to read what they had to say, to track it down. Even if they don't get your book, get the preface and... And show them that respect, you know, really considering what they had to say there. Well, good. Thanks so much, brother. I really appreciate you coming on and uh, reaching out to me, the kind of stuff we love to talk about on this podcast. So I hope it's a blessing to everyone who's listening. Amen. Yeah, and thanks for your work, too. You got a great podcast. You're, you're doing a good work for the church, too. So I appreciate it, brother.